and data quality, um, really we're looking for four things. And, and there's no, there's, there's a lot of um, discussions in academics around how, how do we measure the quality of the data. It's so simple. Question one is, it, is it accurate? Right? So is the information that you actually have in record, is it correct? And there's, of course, third-party append. There's pushing up against uh, other systems. There's other systems of validation. Of course, customers can validate that as well. Is it duplicate-free? Meaning, do you have actually one version of one thing in your database ever one time? And then also, is it complete? Meaning, you know, it's great to have Greg Mallpass in your system, but if you don't know my title, my business, my phone number, my email address, it's not very usable, and that's going to affect your quality. The last piece is, is it normalized? So now that we're seeing the BI layers connect into the actual transactional databases, um, it's so important to have normalized values. And such common challenges are, arise around just simple, simple things like industry and state, state province values. You know, are you, as you're bringing your data, are you cleaning it, transforming it into your standardized formats so then you can pick it up and it shows your report seamlessly. There's indicators, of course, like activity, when, when it was last updated by systems or people, is it consistent? and where do you get it from. So data quality is really interesting when we, when in a lot of cases from a traction perspective, you know, we're, we're coming to situations where clients are well entrenched in the Salesforce environment and their data is now causing them a lot of pain. Maybe they're trying to integrate into a third party system. Maybe they're in a situation where they're trying to actually get kind of that golden record. And we talk a lot about master data management or the, the single kind of version of the truth or 360 view. And in that case, where you know, when, you, when you look at the split, there's, there's kind of two types of organizations that are looking at data quality. There's ones that have the ability to incent the customer to, to participate in qualifying and, and cleaning their records. And then there are those that don't have that ability or they haven't deployed that ability yet. And what's interesting, if you look at the non-incented side, you're gonna have a data append strategy, looking at third-party data to cleanse and rationalize your information, usabilities of, of your overall system. I mean, I mean, how much are you enticing your users to actually use the fields, insert correct data? Is it actually bringing value to them from a day-to-day -day basis? What value is there to them? And then also, what other technical blocks can you put in the system, prohibiting them to move forward in their processes um, based on what, what they've actually inserted in? There's measures. There's culture around quality integration and governance. But when you, and today we're really going to be talking a lot about a, a bit of a different scenario where, you know, in Greg's situation, he has a customer incented environment around data quality um, where there's still a pen and usability, but also the question of, you know, who knows the, you know, the customer data the best and, well, it's the customer, right? So why can't we get them to self-administrate and them to manage their own records? The last thing I'm going to go through very quickly before we get into the fun part of this presentation um, is governance. And I did want to cover this off because we, again, we're having a ton of conversations with, with organizations of all sizes saying, hey, look, I don't trust my um, marketing team to just mass import lists of leads. Or I don't trust my sales users to be able to create account records because there's a bias and they might want to duplicate out accounts or there could be some territory challenges. Um, so data governance is really, the, a set of rules and processes to validate the trust you have in a record, in your data. And the questions are, was it validated by whom or what could be a system? So you could be looking at third-party appends, data.com, you could be looking at the other systems like DMB. Um, you have the source of the origination, where is it being used, and what is the master? So a question of what is the managing, manage, management of the actual record. And the cover of MDM, um, MDM really, when you, talk, when you take a step back, this is just it's just having a golden record, a single view of, of the truth, a single version. So if you're a retail organization and you have membership IDs and the customers are incented to, to manage their own memberships, that's going to be a real source of your golden record. There are a lot of tools out there. And we actually, there was a, there's a number of sites and you can search the App Exchange and we could, I could actually spend the next hour and a half um, explaining each of the tools that we're typically seeing deployed. But when it comes to integration, you're looking at um, your middleware. So it could be open source using something like Jitterbit, Informatica, Boomi, Cast Iron. Um, there's a cleanse and append applications, and we're seeing a huge rise of those in the App Exchange. 
Um, but of course, there's the data.com application, and we're starting to see a lot of third parties starting to provide uh, additional services. WealthX and JetNet are two great examples of third party data sources for Append in Salesforce, where you can actually update records on the 10,000 wealthiest people on the planet if you're looking to, to learn about them. The duplicate management, like CRM Fusion, um, there's also Cloudingo and a number of other duplicate management uh, tools, and then simply natively in Salesforce utilizing simple measures like data scores where you're actually calculating certain numbers of points um, based on how uh, complete a record is, whether or not there's duplicates, et cetera. And Traction, actually, we have some free applications that we can, we'd be happy to share with you that could get you a, a good start on that. And of course, governance. So I rambled through all the boring data stuff in order to kind of get to the most important part of this presentation, which is, um, we really want to blow your minds on a, on, a, on a really cool use case where the, the project that we're talking about with, with Greg here. And what's exciting to me about what we're going to talk about now around data and data projects is, first of all, data projects and cool results typically don't correlate. Let's just call it up, right? Second is heli-ski operations and data don't coexist. Right? Like what heli-ski operations, which is, and we have a little competition whose presentation is cooler, so hopefully you'll rate ours highly. Um, and also small boutique operations, right? So, so really, a small businesses, um, you know, GHC is one, is one of the five most premium heli-ski operations on the planet, but it certainly isn't a large enterprise. How is it possible they're using the best in class technology, the same technology that um, the largest organizations, not only in their category, but even in, in really kind of the sports kind of environment are using. So that would be typically hashtag impossible. Um, so, so really kind of what we're going to talk about today, and Greg, you've been so patiently quiet, so I think I should sort of start sharing the screen. The side. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, let's, let's Well, let me jump in here, because uh, Great Canadian Heliskiing pioneered this concept of boutique heliskiing. We, we take people up in helicopters with guides and ski them down mountains. They come from all over the world, because British Columbia does have the best snow in the world, and uh, we have a, a, an awesome experience for our guests. But, uh, you know, Greg talks about data, and I talk about people, because people are, is what we actually deal with. And, uh, Everyone knows people are a little bit weird. You know, they each have their sort of individual needs and uh, wants and desires. And uh, what we always are trying to do is capture that person. What is their most amazing heli skiing experience? What did they dream of? What did they want when they came from all the way over from Germany or Australia and come to uh, a little town like Golden, BC? What was the experience that they want? So we have this challenge of trying to capture what it is that they want before the trip, figuring it out and getting the feedback during the trip and then actually delivering all in the same breaths. And so it, it works okay when you start off with a housekeeping operation that does seven day trips and, uh, and then actually uh, it gets a whole week long to it. But the whole trend now is the shorter trips, two or three days, uh, that's a higher turnover of customers. And all of a sudden it goes from Greg hosting and learning who uh, Eric and Eric is and all these other people are and what their wants to, to now having to know more and more people and having to sort of uh, deliver that. Not only is it uh, as we grow, it's not just me that's delivering the product, I have a whole team. So how do we capture the data on that person before they come, uh, capture it into a system and distribute? And what we were faced before we came over to Traction was we had islands of da data, like a little bit over here for our, our sales, a little bit over here for our reservations, and another system over here for operations, and none of them talked to one, uh, each other. So really, we had useless sets of data. Maybe important for that one thing, but they had no idea what was coming in. So with Traction, we were able to join up and say, okay, what we need is a single platform for our data. We need ways of capturing that data so that it can come into our system. And then we need a way to distribute it to all the members of our team so we know the specifics about each of those customers. And that's what we did with this project. Um, again, the, the heli skiing is exciting and uh, it's fun and it's not really something you would associate with data, but again, if you set it back to it's the people and it's the people on our team that are delivering these experiences. And so, you know, the, the story I'd like to tell is about the two Eric's. Uh, we have. Eric on, the, on your uh, left there, you know, Eric, he's from Colorado. He's probably the best 
hella skier in the world, at least in his mind he is, he would gladly get up there and uh, tell you at the dinner table. Uh, and uh, what we do know though, uh, he's probably, yeah, his, his ability matches probably uh, three quarters of what he would tell you uh, his ability is. But uh, he also likes scotch after dinner and uh, a few other details that he, he is important for his trip. The other guy, you know, we, Andy uh, from uh, Hong Kong here, he's actually New York and Hong Kong. He's, uh, he's a little bit of a different guy. He, 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 I always call him, he looks a little bit like Andy Warhol uh, when he gets his, he's got some new sets of uh, thick glasses on here. And uh, he's totally different. He came and started skiing at the age of 40. Uh, he's a very humble, quiet guy. And uh, his whole experience for heli skiing is about you know, challenging himself, learning how to powder ski, and, uh, and he actually likes a glass of milk after dinner, not scotch. So these are sort of the details of, we have the two Eric's and everything in between, and we've got to get them in and find out about who these individuals are and then deliver the service. So what uh, kind of comes across there, again, the, the multiple systems that we're trying to manage, um, you know, trying to find out really who this person is, how can we get a real clear picture of that data that's not sort of filtered through uh, hearsay or two sets of uh, pieces of information and how to uh, segment them into the groups as well. So I think that's where Traction has came in and they've done an exceptional job of uh, putting together a technical package that includes Salesforce and uh, portals and a few other tricks that they had up their sleeves to make sure that we could uh, push that data through our system. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what's interesting about the Great Canadian Heli Ski situation was when we first met, when Greg and I kind of first sat down and, and had a chat, it was, hey, look, you know, we need to create a better guest experience. And, and, but when we started looking at that, the, you know, the foundation, the fundamental challenges that they were facing was, first of all, paperwork. So Greg's vision of, of a customer coming on site to Heli Ski was, you know, basically to, to enter pure vacation mode. Mm -hmm. right? and, and typically the first thing that you're doing is you're signing, do you check, do you do all your waivers? Do we have the pre-flight information? Do, hey, do you have a peanut allergy? Because we're having peanuts tonight. <laughs> um, so there, was, there were all these kind of complications. And, and so the question was, well, how can we get rid of that? How can we make it just a pure experience? You're on site, you're here to heli-ski, let's just heli-ski, right? The next was there's inconsistencies between the brand and the brand experience. And, and what was interesting, if, if we, when we first sat down, we, we looked at the, the site, we looked at kind of the, what Greg's vision was with the actual quality service he was providing, um, and what, the, what he envisioned, there was, there was, a, there was a disconnect. And, and it, was, it was actually a really interesting consideration as we go into this because it changed the order of even the, the process and the work that we would do with him. We would recommend another partner in front of us to help him get the most high value component before we actually started engaging. The other thing was, you know, the only way to know the customer at present was to see them. Um, so there was no single view. As Greg had mentioned, many systems um, kind of bringing different perspectives. And in the question of um, the, actual, the actual guides not knowing where to put what information and it never really synchronizing it up. And then also seeing if someone changes, let's say, their, um, uh, their ski preference, how's that going to syndicate into the rest of the system, the reservation system. The other consideration was the marketing programs couldn't be specific because the information wasn't being delivered to the marketing tools. So when, when you, you know, even though you've, you've skied 54 heli ski days and you have eight days until your next one, you know, you're still going to get, hey, how about come and, heli, come and heli ski with us? And so there's some real considerations in there. Um, so while data would be the core, really, there's this whole question of how do, we get, how do we get people in the door? And how do we find people? And so um, GHC later would, would go down the performance edition of Salesforce, having data.com as one data source, but also thinking about even their web environment, web properties. How do we collect the right information? How do we pass that between systems and people, action on it, convert it to an experience, and really um, manage the hygiene on an ongoing basis for the real kind of challenges? So when we sat down, the first thing we really kind of saw was, look, um, if you don't have an audience, there's not much point in having a system to manage that audience. So as a boutique heli-ski operation, 
great Canadian health scheme had gotten to the point where it is because you were doing a good job of managing, despite all the data and the pain that you were having, and managing that you're, you're doing all right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this was all about growth and the broader opportunity. Um, and we needed to drive voluntary registration. So we needed to pull people into that system. Um, and so what we did was we made an introduction to an organization called Pearly and White that did um, a lot of brand work for them. And if you go to the Great Canadian Heliski, and, and, and please pay attention to this, some of the slides as you get, we get into the portals and some of the real kind of examples as we're going through. What was really exciting about this is we were able to weave the brand through every web property that a customer would touch. And that includes internally in Salesforce through portals. So Greg, the, you know, is there? Yeah, so I mean, th that was the critical thing. I mean, basically, the way I look at it, if you're sitting in Germany uh, or Australia shopping for hella skiing, uh, actually at that point, you're buying what you're seeing uh, as our brand online. And so I've seen a lot of other, uh, you know, portal options or form options, and they kind of want to steer you to jump over here to fill out a form or fill out a portal, and it doesn't associate, you might be able to stick your logo up in the, the top corner. It's like, it just won't do, you know, the, the experience has to be uh, seamless. There's also a sense of trust when you get your brand uh, pushed across all the platforms and all the, the, the ways that the, the customer is touching it. They start believing that you are a company that, that has it all together. As soon as I find if you're pushing them off to other sites, they lose that trust. They say, who is this company? Is it, you know, is it you know, this uh, third party plus a logo? Or, but in this way, it's seamless. We're always there. Our brand is always present. Yep. And so when it came down to actually getting everything out, we wanted to, to streamline also the mix between mobile, the mobile interfacing, and the, of course, the traditional kind of web interface. And then, of course, there was kind of the, um, really the embedded experience from a, a brand perspective. So adaptive templates. Um, we use Salesforce for basic lead acquisition, right? So, so basically pulling the leads and the initial uh, information in. Um, World-class brand for world-class product. And really um, a very pragmatic measured approach to the marketing piece. And, and then we were ready for the data. And so when it came to the second step, which is, okay, well, now we're starting to drive some attendance. We have a basic instance of Salesforce stood up. Um, really, we wanted to, to have a system that where Greg could ask the real questions that he had within his business. So we had to, to generate the guest records in the system, bring all the historical trip interests, um, all the grouping. So typically, you're not on a helicopter by yourself. You're with the up to, well, I guess to, up to four other people. Um, and, and one of the, the key experiences is, is they'll still fly, fly a helicopter without four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they, we needed to look at the B2C person account model, and there's some discussions around that. We'll talk about migrate all the history as if the system had been there since the inception of the business, and then really um, start driving the initial activity management, trip summaries, and bring a broader sense of insight so, so they could start to understand where, where you're going to really invest your time and money. When it came to data structure, you know, there's, it's nice to kind of say, hey, look, we stood up a system and we, we brought a bunch of data in, um, but the project would have multiple phases. Right? So this is really, this is a technology transformation for a heli-ski operation um, where Greg was saying, look, I'm subscribing to a single platform and I want that to run my business. And then, so we're sitting there saying, well, this is phases. We can't just do the whole thing. We can't even manage the amount of change management that would happen within a business if we were to roll out this much functionality at once. Um, so how do we anticipate everything? How do we accommodate dependent technologies and how do we manage short-term um, pain with long-term strategy? And what was interesting is when you start looking at data and you start asking, um, working, working with your stakeholders to try to understand how we're going to structure the information, how we're going to collect the information, the greatest insights are going to come from, from the teams, under, how they measure their organization. So what questions are you asking the data in order for you to make meaningful actions? Um, so also, not just the executive, but working with uh, the subset teams and trying to figure out you know, what, what questions are the guides most frequently asking and what's meaningful to the guests? Yeah. And I think on that note, it's really interesting. And maybe we haven't highlighted enough, but uh, in our Salesforce platform, we went beyond just the, the, the lead generation and the sales. And you'll see later that we've built on basically a, a time-based inventory system, so a, a booking and reservation system. Not only that, we've also built on there our operational systems where we are grouping, associating runs, and all these aspects. But, so you really start seeing 
you know, whether you're part of lead and uh, lead generation, marketing and sales, or whether you're part of a reservations team, or whether you're a guide in the field, or even part of our lodge team, we have that one center piece of data. So it doesn't matter where, who you are and which questions you're asking, you can pull what you need from that. Uh, um, if you're a guide and you wanted to know where this person came from, what were they talking about when they bought the package, you know, what abilities were they were, uh, they were uh, presenting themselves as, these questions have been answered possibly eight months ago, but our guides still have that real time when that person arrives and, and they're organizing their trip and grouping the guides. So you can see the power of having that data captured and right across our organization in that platform. And you see a little bit on some of the notes there. Uh, you know, the other point is we have a whole pre-trip administration process there that we've had to hit on there with waivers and uh, getting the feedback. And so again, we, all the data is there and it just, the, actually, it's the imagination and the, the questions can be answered. If you tell, ask me a question tomorrow, I can pull the data to you uh, one minute afterwards. It's, it's just that simple for us to be able to capture that. So that was our, our main, main focus there. Yeah. And, and as you look at this ERD, or the, the Salesforce Schema Browser, really of, of great Canadian Heli Skis um, system, what's interesting about it is, is really kind of some, a lot of the, the ancillary items, like the fact that they're tracking the terrain and the ski runs, right? So with later when we talk about how do we incent people to participate in, in updating the records and, and really kind of participating in this, this system, there's forced methods that we'll talk about around waivers and, and, and e-signature do, and documents, but also there's just the incentivizing it, like how many vertical did I ski last year? How many, how many vertical, ski, vertical feet did my buddies ski last year? Um, so there were some significant choices also around data. So how many people in the room are, well, I can see mostly are yellow badges. So how many are B2B, uh, traditional B2B businesses? Awesome. And how many B2C? So obviously a smaller number. And of the B2C customers that have deployed, how many of you are using person accounts? One. <laughs> No, it's fair. And, and what's interesting is um, it's sometimes it makes a lot of sense to use person accounts if it's a focused, dedicated B2C business. There's no B2B play there. And it also depends on the type of information you're bringing in. And we're, we're actually at present deploying um, a, a retailer um, that was not spoken about today. Um, and they, they have over 10,000 locations. And uh, we've chosen not to use a person account data structure for them. In fact, so, it's, so there's always going to be some, some interesting decisions. But for the great Canadian Heliski, B2C, um, using person accounts because Greg's company only works with people. It doesn't matter what organization you work for um, and you, what job you change, it's all about you. Um, the other thing, the other principles that we applied was number one, we want to use leverage native functionality within the platform before custom. So utilizing roll-ups, simple junctions, and standard objects. And then also then we would use third-party tools, right? So you can see we're avoiding a lot of the deep customizations and a lot of the getting deep into Apex until we absolutely had to. Um, the last thing was also looking at, from a data perspective, um, once we had the systems and the integrations that stood up, what participa participation would we need from the employees? So at the tail end of the first, of the second phase, sorry, it was, you know, gathering leads, right? The ability to set up bookings, complete contracts, run accurate reports, and update details. And the third phase, and this is where it gets really interesting, and this is a bit of a, it's a very different data presentation than I would normally do around data quality, was, was there was always a vision to expose this to the public, right? To, for the customers to participate. And that's what really kind of drove a, a really, bit of a re-engineered approach to a project or program, I should say. Um, and so basically the vision was, was, you know, how do we get all the administration out of the way, right? If you look at those, think about those earlier slides, how do we make sure the guest experience kind of is all the admin and paperwork and payments are all taken, about, taken care of so people can just enjoy their experience. So Greg, I don't know if you have much to add there. Well, I mean, if you think about what we're delivering, and who our customer is, you know, our customer is typically a, a professional or a, a, an executive of a company. Um, these guys live and breathe the world of business. And as soon as you introduce the idea 
of a negotiation or a co administration or contract. It's very funny. There's two sets of personalities. There's you know CEO on holiday and then the CEO executing a, a negotiation or administration. So what we realize is if we can pull out that administration and any of that sort of sense of business out of our holiday experience, we get the CEO on holiday, the whole experience. And so that was a main driver of what we were trying to do with the portals and uh, keeping holiday time, which is where we want to start, uh, and, and administration, completely two separate experiences. Awesome. The one other interesting piece was also, you know, when you think about accurate data, you can't ask every question all at the beginning, right? So, so if you're, if you're, there's a, there's a direct correlation in terms of how much information a human being will complete um, in terms of the number of fields at a certain point in time. And so if you think about lead forms, you want them nice and light because you want to capture the lead. You don't want to deter somebody so you don't ask too many questions. It has to be, make sense that you're asking that particular question. Um, and actually another best practice in, for all of you B2B guys, in, even in app, is utilizing the cross-reference of record types and page layouts in order to kind of do progressive profiling almost in your opportunity layouts. So first, first stage, create an opportunity, it's a suspect. Maybe you just need to know the name of the deal, the close date, the stage, and the next step, right? But then they flip it into a qualification. You have some validation that makes them complete a few more fields and maybe another section opens up because you're flipping the record type and exposing a new page layout. You can also even do sim simple signals and, uh, and formula fields even that could render different images um, that kind of suggest what people should be doing. Well, what was interesting when we looked, um, looked at Great Canadian Heliski, it was what questions can we ask at each stage? So when we think about the data quality and building kind of that golden or that quality record at a lead, we're looking for interest, ability, and profile, right? Like, what, what do you need to know, Greg, about somebody when they're, when they're talking? About when we're really trying to keep it simple, it, our mode changes very quickly. And uh, if we're just being introduced to this person, you know, all we do need is a name and uh, you know, email address to get going. But then we also always ask the question of, have you heliskied before? Because it's a real different approach, whether we're educating them or whether we're selling them on our, our uh, value uh, that we provide. So that's just at the very basic as one uh, example of one sort of uh, way that we segment right off the beginning. Yeah. And while a lot of it was inbound, there's also um, pulling lists from data.com for CEOs or, or specific organizations are trying to find correlations there too, right? For sure, for sure. Um, once you go through the conversion process and you have that account, then the next question is, okay, well, when do you want to ski or ride with us? Um, and who are your buddies? The maybe kind of the high level pipeline kind of information. Yeah. yeah. Um, then going into the bookings, um, we started collecting information around the trip. So when do you want to go? Specifically, what trip? What are the other guests? Have you completed all your waivers? What are your preferences? And then it got into the passenger day. And the passenger day, the the guides are essentially keeping track of what you're doing. Yeah. Right. How, which runs you skied? You know, how much vertical was included in that ski? Who were in your group uh, of that day? all these things, and you can only imagine how valuable, again, that goes back to the salespeople after the trip. Now they've got a capture of the experience. Uh, and that's important to us because 65% of our customers are repeat customers. So when that salesperson's talking again, it's nice to know, say, hey, you skied a heck of a lot last year. You had 50,000 meters in your week, and then you got them, man. You were riding. The value's right there. The salesperson knows uh, that this person's bought, uh, that this sold on what we're doing. Um, the one other uh, great kind of component here is while the system, right, Salesforce system was collecting this information and, and people are of course entering their certain forms, um, the bookings and all the, the waivers were actually completed by DocuSign, inserting and appending existing records within the database or servicing through the portal. Um, what was also happening is the marketing automation layer was actually doing proactive calls to people saying, hey look, you're going to ski in five days and we don't have your waiver. So like, come on back. Um, so the systems would essentially proactively be handling a lot of the interaction with the customers, but still giving them one-to-one -one feel. Tons of automation there, for sure. Um, so at this point, I don't want to discredit any of the amazing stuff that you guys did in terms of the customer facing and the portals. So I'm going to hand it over to Greg. Okay. Greg's going to kind of 
walk through some of the, the elements just to show you guys how that data is collected. Yeah, so I mean, I'm basically on our web, this is part of our website, and so someone's gone through, we've hooked them, they're excited about maybe checking out a trip. So right again, what the, the form, what's exciting for us, this form is feeding right back into Salesforce. So as soon as they ask us, we've got a lead generated in Salesforce. We aren't having to you know, import some new data again. So that's pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, all of our marketing materials that we're pushing out there as well are again all tied into it so that if we also know their interactions with our materials, how often they're clicking through, what they might click through. In this example, we might have uh, you know, a list of different packages we offer at the bottom. We know this person clicked for a package. When our sales team goes in there, it's awesome. You know, we know what they're looking for. We know not to sell them on a short, quick package. They're looking at four or five days. Um, Again, we've done some cool things with uh, some of our partners like Arcteryx and Armada. Uh, they uh, joined us in uh, a good, great marketing campaign and the giveaway. And again, you can see that on the bottom of the question there, it's uh, have you held a ski before? And so right away, we've clicked a whole data set right into our system that will live with that uh, person all the way through to potentially uh, when they're a customer with us. Um, this was the really exciting part because sure we had the platform and our data all there, but then now we turn around and say, hey, this person often buys this trip, you know, a year to five months ahead of the, t uh, the time, and now we launched into the login. It has our brand on it, you know, when they get this, it's automatically launched once they've made their booking. Into it they go, we get uh, an upload picture for them. So when that person, especially when they're a new customer, they walk in the door, we're greeting them. Hey, Jeff Applin, you know, it's your first time here. Welcome. And let us give you a tour around the property and see that on our, our front desk is trained for all of that. Uh, again, we've also captured what they wanted to, uh, to eat and what any allergies or any other details in there. Uh, this was a really cool set because uh, in heli skiing, there's a whole set of legal documents and administration that we done. We do. I think we have, we have a waiver. We have a, a ski rental document. We have a binding release that you have to do. We have a medical declaration. Like, what a downer when you've been waiting a year long for your trip to have to be plunked with all this paperwork. So now uh, they do it electronically in the portal and. Uh, I think a really cool thing to note here is not just that they've done it. A lot of this, these forms are pre-filled for them because of the data we've collected already. So they're on there and it's like, it's not like this huge thing that they have to fill out. We already identified that we know who they are and we have their information and then they electronically signature off and uh, boom, it's done. There's also an interesting piece on the, the e-signature and contracting component too, which is, let's say you have first name, last name, um, and you don't have the, you likely have email address because they're a portal sign in. Yeah. Let's say you don't have their phone number. Yeah. You don't have a mobile phone or an emergency contact. Yeah. And that's an important component of, of one of these, these documents. Um, or let's say you have it and it's incorrect. So in that situation, if a customer actually fills in the legally binding document and submits, it actually updates the core record in Salesforce. So this is the question of what is the master? And or better yet, imagine if your, your wife or your spouse booked your trip for you last year and they said, you know, don't give this guy any meat or any desserts. And uh, now that you have access to your portal, you can kind of change that. Like, give me all the red meat you want and all the desserts because, <laughs> I, and just don't tell my wife. Um, these are the kind of things of the power that's given to the customer in this experience. Um, and then again, as you can see on the side, it's, uh, you're, you're seeing the completed uh, as they go along and make the steps. If any of these steps are incomplete, uh, it's automated. They're reminded. Uh, they get a reminder as their trip's coming up, uh, which can imagine. I mean, we're, we're a small business. Uh, imagine the legwork that's gone into and previously chasing people for information. My goodness, I could tell you stories. So uh, one other thing I didn't I'd point out in the last slide there, if you look just on the sidebar on the left, you can see the customer says, uh, there's eight days left before your trips. Uh, starts, you have skied 52 days with us already and your total vertical in the past as well. So there's kind of little cool features that engage the customer in there. We also have a couple little cool things that you can post it on Facebook on the left column uh, that they've just booked, you know, brag to your friends a little bit and uh, even get your forecast going on there. Um, and then behind the scenes, this is the business. This is what uh, we need to know if you're making uh, bookings and, uh, and sales and that. You, you need to know 
uh, which slots are available, and which are booked. So we have that all tied in there. And then when the customer does arrive, here's the things that our guides filling out there, grouping them up for the day, making any changes for the transceiver numbers or their weights or uh, whether they're ski or snowboarder, and the guides rating their ability. So again, we know truly whether this guy is awesome skier or just says he's an awesome skier. The guide's ratings are usually what we default to. Uh, but we know how to market to that person <laughs> if they still think they're an awesome skier. So, uh, and then in the end, uh, after their days of heliskiing, we have uh, the number of runs. Uh, we will list, uh, we do 10 to 18 runs in a day and each customer will have uh, uh, kept track of every run that they've done and uh, have that further information in the past. Again, the power of it is before this would be captured in the, 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 uh, just in the guides world. Now the sales team has access to all this information as well. Awesome. Thanks, right, Greg. Sure. So, so there's, you know, I want to make sure because we, we have done a bit of an experimental data presentation today, um, but I did want to make sure that we kind of, we pull out a lot of, a, a number of kind of key table takeaways for you guys. But the one, the one interesting thing about this whole story and, and especially on those last few slides was when we look at data quality, your existing employees and your customers are going to be the greatest source of the greatest quality. Right? So how do you drive adoption? Right? What's the usability of the system? And if I, if I scan back here, you can see from a usability perspective, um, time and attention that was put into developing a system that made a lot of sense. Right? When you look at the travel booking and the, and the booking grids, and this is actually going right into the marketing automation tool that's actually going to even flag the potential short-term or temporary secured spots on that on the whirly bird um, I don't know if that's even a current term but hopefully um, work but for the three plus one things the things that that are really um, key takeaways is companies with islands of data walls work against themselves and and this is this is kind of when Greg and I were kind of wrapping up this presentation one of the things he he was kind of pretty clear on is look we were wasting a ton of time and we were actually causing stalls in our business so the next one was, you know, systems without quality data are perceived as a bad system. So it doesn't matter how much money you put into your implementation of Salesforce or any of the ancillary systems that are supporting it, if the data is poor, the system will be, will be perceived as poor. So when you're looking at rolling out new functionality, you're looking at um, even your initial deployment of Salesforce, only expose what you trust and don't go for everything all at once because you're going to create tremendous risk and you'll never earn the respect of your users back. Um, it's a, it is a bit of an irreversible po uh, point and that's when your salespeople and, and your core users start becoming disheartened and they stop trusting it and then you see other systems start layering in. The next one is when it comes to driving quality data, you need to consider asking for the right information at the right time. Right. So when is it appropriate for you to be asking the customer to fill out certain information on their, their personal preferences? Allergies probably aren't the most appropriate fields to be putting on a lead form. They certainly are meaningful at the waiver stage. Um, and the last one and, and the last, probably the most important piece that I'd like to leave everyone with is, is really you need to consider to look at every interaction you have with your users and, and especially your customers as an opportunity to improve the quality of your data. And it doesn't have to be all at once, right? So we see progressive forms, we saw contracts as a data source, we see portal as a data source here, we have third party append through, through other systems. It's just find the right uh, portfolio of data quality improving tools at the right time. Um, you, and then in some situations, you may get in situations where you need to, to use third party tools to kind of do the one time cleanses um, but really the ultimate goal is to avoid that, right? To, to make the actual a culture of data quality an important part of your overall system. So with that, we thought we would stop and open it up to ask anything. Great. Any? Yes, please. Did, did we, sorry, write the... Hmm? Yeah. Technical the question. Back end. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so basically, this this is all running on sales. Yeah. So the question was, you know, what tools? Essentially, what systems uh, did you deploy for the customer portal? What is it sitting on, and how did you style it? Is that fair? Um, so, so basically, this is Salesforce customer portal. Um, it's and what we've done is we've created Visual Force pages um, that essentially are rendering uh, the the records in line. 
Um, because we're using person accounts, the authentication is done all through the contact record in Salesforce through the customer portal user. Um, and actually one of the interesting next steps that'll be, that are gonna happen is actually the use of, of chatter and, and automation in terms of chatter groups. So once you're in a helicopter with four other people, um, the system will automatically generate a group and create a social experience for you as well that you, that you can then syndicate onto your social networks. So that's all using native functionality with, with let's call it the visual force styling on top. Uh, so Greg and Greg, uh, on, uh, ask anything, how much? I know you're in the business of doing this stuff. Yeah. Set expectations on, you know, you're looking to set a budget on what it's gonna take to get to that level. It's a great question and you know, uh, going into it, we knew we were looking for these opportunities and we had a fortunate opportunity where we actually tapped into some government funding to, uh, to do uh, parts of this trip. Uh, DTAP uh, is a IRAP program, so dig digital technology adoption pilot project. So that is a, a part and parcel of what you're doing. You know, we've been working on this about two years, different parts and parcels, but I was looking at it from a point of view. I took, uh, you know, because part different portions of this marketing and aspect, I would say I took uh, you know, half of our marketing budget over two years to do some of the front end stuff. And then we also took another, uh, basically a paid employee uh, salary worth uh, for another year to say, okay, this is gonna save us in some of the implementation. So depending on which aspects you're sharing, we're, we're probably in between the, we're probably between the 80 and $100,000 mark in total over the two years that we spend. I have to add, we do have other, you know, um, we haven't showed all the gems <laughs> that are in there. So there is a few other things that were uh, uh, big ticket items within that, that budget. Is it okay for you to share the, how much subsidy you got? Or is that? Uh, yeah, you no, know, it's, it's, uh, it's public information. So we were able to uh, acquire uh, 80,000 on the uh, first round and 70,000 on our second year. So we've had about $150,000 in supporting subsidies uh, through DTAP. And that's not just the system. That's not just traction or anything. That we did all sorts of other parts and parcels in that as well. Yeah. Uh, going back to the tools that you used, uh, going back to the tools that you used for a solution like that, uh, yeah. is it basically uh, Visual Force, or did you mix Visual Force with regular HTML and that sort of thing? Yeah, so, so you're talking about the portal, yes. right? Because there's, there's a few, so just the portal experience is done, it's, it's Visual Force pages, which essentially you're, you're using Apex to tie the Visual Force pages into the, into the actual Salesforce interface, into Salesforce. Um, and then, but really Visual Force is, is, it just houses HTML or HTML5. It's a standard markup language within Visual Force wrappers. So what we're doing is we're essentially almost creating a web page, then we're, we're putting it into Salesforce and then we're connect, putting basically the field connectors within that page and using Salesforce's authentication layer around it. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Oh, it's a continuation of the question, sorry. Uh, is there a reason to bypass the marketing automation tool on that process? Can I think directly to Salesforce? Well, actually, there is a marketing automation. A very important piece is um, all the initial acquisition, so all those forms are actually being rendered through a marketing auto automation platform. Uh, the other piece is the mark one of the tricks around the, the architecture I didn't get too deep into is we wanted to build an architecture that could be actually read right through by the automation tool. So it could actually look at which waivers have been completed and kind of the subtleties in the data architecture were utilizing roll-up summaries and trying to make sure we didn't make the marketing automation tool too complex to manage on a, on a project basis. So, so that was a, a very kind of valuable component. There's still a lot of workflow, kind of a work, simple workflow rules and a lot of declarative, um, but the, the only really complicated apex portion of that implementation is the booking grid. That would be probably the most complex mm -hmm. component. Uh, there's a few people that I can see in the audience that would probably be nodding their heads and feeling a little red in the face over that one. Please. I uh, just want to get a clear idea of the scope of the project before you engage with traction, or if this started out it's just a... What? You know, I think the, the start of the project really was the frustration of these islands of technology and just knowing that. I mean, I look at all these other businesses out the world and, and realize that there's businesses that are making a living just on collecting people's data. Like, and here we have a set of customers that are really valuable long term to us. And so that was the motivation uh, by beforehand. And I think what I realized fairly quickly is that I, 
there are options where you can plug all sorts of these things together, and, uh, but it just the, you lose the power of the single platform of data. So when I went into it, I, I, um, I, I compare, we did a lot of uh, process mapping beforehand, uh, separate, uh, before we even engaged, and uh, that did tell the story of what we were trying to accomplish on a single platform. And again, one of our project goals was, again, that single platform. So that eliminated probably quite a few choices uh, what we could have, um, might have otherwise select. Because there's all sorts of reservation systems and everything else out there, and they, but they tack on a little bit of CRM. And then the opposite, you get another CRM system, and maybe they have a little bit of lightweight uh, inventory management. But this was really uh, the idea that we say, this is an investment worthwhile once we've captured. Uh, and I just see it in my mind, it's just, it's a customer. Like that's always the constant through our whole business, that customer. And so if that data just travels, it should always be with that customer and that everyone should always be able to pull out from that customer. That's, it. that's how I see it in a non-technical uh, terms. And that's what they accomplished, yeah. Well, and candidly, there were some review points, right? Like when it came to the booking and booking registration, well, hey, what, does Salesforce do this? No, it doesn't. Okay, what does do it? How much does it cost? And then there's some build versus buy discussions. That the kind of Greg made the decision and the go forward on. Um, so one of the things from our perspective, especially in the booking registration inventory of, of booking seats perspective, we did a bit of a POC beforehand just to make sure we were all confident that it was the right approach. Oh. Um, what tools did you use from, uh, what, what tools did you use for data migration? Oh, data migration? It was Apex Data Loader. So we didn't, just, we didn't use any third-party ETL or anything advanced. What we did um, in this case, it was, it was basically data loader in, and then we used some CRM fusion to do some cleansing and standardization. Um, in some cases, when we're getting into really advanced data migration, what we will typically do, um, if we're seeing kind of, depending on the source systems, but let's say it's, you, there's a ton of, ton of SQL data, we'll use something like a dbamp to basically take that data, structure it all correctly in SQL, and then actually upload through dbamp into Salesforce. So there's different kind of platforms, different tools, or some cases a client might have Informatica Cloud or be already subscribing to Boomi, so we'll do the migration through those tools. But I would say, what, nine times out of 10, um, we're using standard data, uh, data loader. Please. You uh, developed a lot of this uh, course pre-Salesforce 1. Yeah. Let's see, that's a, that's a great question. Um, because, well, Salesforce One is just about mobile, right? And, and the, I think there's the one thing that I th actually that is going to change the plan going forward, actually, is, and we've had a conversation around, um, what, about, what are we going to do about the, the logging the run? So right now, in a helicopter, the guide is not sitting there with an iPad logging in right? But because of internet connectivity and all these other pieces. So they're actually they're kind of keeping notes and then they're going when they, and uh, Greg has a great story about, you know, a helicopter guide with big fat fingers saying this is the best thing ever because I don't have to go down to the booking room after all the guests go to bed and, and key in their runs. Um, he can do it on his iPad or whatever. Um, but what's interesting about Salesforce One is we're going to be able to stand up a lot of the kind of the mobile functionality for the guest interaction for the staff just natively, just turn it on. Um, but when it comes to the booking grids and some of the more advanced stuff, we will be doing uh, essentially phone gap wrappers around each, you know, HTML5 to, to kind of make the app-like experience and also that allows us to store some data in memory on the device and then sync up when they, when they land or get back into Wi-Fi. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Just curious, is data.com your best source of data? Uh, it, it, we have, I mean, our best source of data is actually our referrals from our other customers uh, in that sense. And so there is a lot of sort of uh, referral processes trying to tie into there. Uh, data.com is actually fairly new for us to explore. So, you know, I'll tell you in six months. But what the power of it is because of the, the type of clientele, uh, even though we're B2C, uh, to be able to identify, you know, within specific markets, uh, specific uh, titles and, and, and positions in companies and be able to target that, it's really exciting. 
I'm really looking forward to seeing what the results out of that is. And knowing that we are sending specific messaging to them, where you have a whole different idea of how we're going to approach those customers uh, and, uh, and to figure out and weed out, are these guys at all interested? So we'll know who, if any of them click through, uh, we'll know, okay, there's a qualified lead, yeah. Yep. It's interesting, the use case, right, for data.com is, is really, it's not to manage the record, it's to find maybe net new prospects, yeah. and then pull them, into, pull them into their personal view. So once you've divorced, the kind of the, the company kind of disappears and you don't really care about the title, and now you, you have that person engaging and actually filling the personal record. So their, their use case is a little bit different than traditional B2C, or B2B, sorry. Yeah, there's a question just up yeah. here. Yeah. I was just going to ask, you've obviously had some, uh, I guess, significant gains in terms of operational efficiency. Would your customers say that their experience has changed significantly? Yeah, you know, there is, of course, you know, going through that adoption process for your customers as well. And that's why we were really adamant that there has to be pieces of data that go back to them. Um, but uh, I was just talking to a guest last week about their experience, and it's, he was talking about how psyched he got, you know, excited about his trip coming up when he was filling out his data. <laughs> so it's kind of, uh, and I think you realize they're anticipating this trip and just any sort of one step closer to the trip as being a really positive aspect uh, and something we need to leverage more, uh, knowing that they're in that portal place. And that's what the exciting possibilities of maybe adding chatter and those other <laughs> elements, connecting them with other customers as they're approaching, because there is a huge anticipation uh, um, aspect that we're not leveraging. There must be like some level of post-purchase dissonance, right? Like I've just basically, okay, I have credit card processed and it's three months. Actually, I can speak personally on this. <laughs> so in March, I'm heli skiing. And so I've laid down my credit card and it's in three months. I'm really excited about it. But I'm kind of like in this middle kind of stasis where I'm like, all right, I'd love to feel like I've got it, but I don't have it yet. Um, but so now there's, what I'm, what's neat is I'm starting to get snow reports and, uh, and just get touched over the course of time um, before my trip. So I can say personally my experience, although my first time experience with Great Canadian, um, I'm pretty stoked about it. Awesome. Okay. What's your ongoing data ID strategy? You know, I, I think, again, going back to the idea, then that customer books again, their data is exposed to them. So if they change their address or they change their phone number, they can catch up on that and correct it for us and uh, keep it up. So in essence, the data strategy is keep exposing the data to the customer. They're the most knowledgeable uh, person about that data. So that's the most basic level. At the same time, we will review, and uh, I don't know all the programs. There, we'll run some saying what, what, what pieces are being used and what's not, what needs to be uh, tweaked on there and improved. Yeah. Uh, for the lead data, cleaning and, and, and coffee. You know, it's a lot of our, even our lead generation is still customer filling out the data. Like uh, our giveaway, our Terex giveaway and those sort of forms, we've got them entered in there as well. And then uh, by pushing it back out to them and, and any of the marketing materials, the only time we really need to really get that data nailed again is when they're engaging for the purchase process. So then we have the ability to reintroduce that data to them. I can add a really different use case. So we've done a lot of work with uh, Bombardier Aerospace. And, and so basically in their situation, they are still working B2C, but there's third party data sources that actually have meaningful B2C data for them. One is, well, I mentioned WealthX and JetNet. So what happens is when they introduce a record from one of those sources, they actually choose which record and which components of the record they trust from the source. And in doing that, um, that allows, that, that is actually managed on an ongoing basis. So, so JetNet or WealthX can actually instruct change to the record on an ongoing basis and alert the sales rep of, of what the change is and allow them to accept it or deny it. So there's certainly, while well, there's standard tools available through, through the Salesforce's interface and of course through data.com using the clean functionality. Um, you can also get creative in utilizing other third party APIs. Apparently they lost the cane that you know, reaches out here and grabs us by okay, the neck and okay, pulls okay, us okay. off. All right, and so uh, unfortunately we'll have to end the presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Yep. Yep. Thanks guys. <laughs> All right.